Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Hey. Th thank you all for coming and attending the uh, AI uh, NCED Forum on Smart Cities and Mobility. Uh, my name is Jesse, and I will be your host for this vertical. And uh, I am uh, uh, in charge of the robot of the year, and we do the ethical development of robotics and AI. And I'm very pleased to uh, introduce you to our final, our panelists today. They come from uh, different backgrounds, different countries, and we are going to talk about what smart cities are, what mobility is, and kind of get to some of the challenges, uh, especially from your point of view, from a user point of view. What are the challenges and issues that you face what do you want from a smart city? What is the design that you want? And hopefully we can challenge these guys a little bit to answer some tough questions about what that looks like and uh, what, you know, from a user point of view, what are the challenges that you feel? And hopefully we can uh, get them to answer some of them if we can. So without further ado, I'd like to first introduce our speaker, our first speaker of the day. His name is David Bengali, and he is the head of business development for Abija. And he is uh, specializing in the first stage, early stage Japanese startups in technology uh, enter the global market. David has experience with establishing subsidiaries, localizing businesses, and models in the Japanese, US, and Singaporean markets. He is currently managing the global business initiatives and strategy at Abija, providing expertise, education, and consultation for enterprises and conglomerates in the Asian region. So please put your hands together for David. Thank you very much. Um, let's see here. Does this work? So that introduction was very long. It looks better on paper. It doesn't sound as well when you, when you actually speak it out loud. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, perfect. All right. Uh, we only have 20 minutes, so uh, let's jump straight to it. Where is this going? Oh, okay. Then I guess I am. Yes, okay. I'll, I'll just say next. Perfect. Great. Next. Uh, very manual. Perfect. Yeah. So um, I come f I work for a company called Abeja. So uh, we have been around for about six years. Uh, we are current investors, including NVIDIA, uh, Google. We're also official machine learning partner of AWS in Japan. So from what we know, we are the only one in this field who actually have all three. So that's pretty interesting. And why do we have that? Next. So over the last six years, we have done more than uh, 200 successful machine learning deep learning implementation uh, with conglomerates all over the world. So we have a lot of experience, which is a very key thing in this industry. Next. Great. So uh, these are some of the companies that we have worked with. So first of all, we have Daikin. I think everyone here knows Daikin. Uh, Komatsu is the second largest construction and mining uh, machinery manufacturer in the world. So we are their smart, uh, smart construction pr uh, providers. So we do all the machine learning, deep learning for them. Uh, SMRT, and everyone here in Singapore knows SMRT. Denso, Chubu, and Aeon. So uh, Denso is, uh, you can read it there. But the key point here is that all of these are all over the place, but they all have one thing in common, and that is depending upon how you define uh, smart city solutions, they all have solutions for smart cities. Next. So the a problem here is then what is a smart city? Next. Um, and this is from Wikipedia, which is one of my favorite websites. So a smart city is an urban area that uses different types of electronic data collection sensors to supply information which is used to manage assets and resources efficiently. This includes data collected from citizens, devices, assets that is processed and analyzed to monitor, and here we go, manage traffic, transportation systems, power plants, water supply networks, waste management, law enforcement, information systems, schools, libraries, hospitals, and other community services. So basically, everything that has technology in it. And that is a huge problem, because if you cannot narrow it down, what is it actually? Next. So this is a slide that we show as part of our uh, typical sales deck, showcasing the stuff that we have done. right? And 
again, to the, similar, to the slide before, uh, dep depending on how you define a smart city, all of these solutions can be applied to smart city, can be called a smart city solutions. So what is actually a smart city? Right? Next. Um, next. <laughs> so uh, let's take a step back and actually think a little bit. What is the core value that a smart city is supposed to provide? Next. Great. So this uh, is a screenshot of Google. Uh, simple keyword search, smart city for images. Now, can anyone tell me what's wrong with this picture? Anyone? Sorry? Thank you. Where are the citizens? Right? It's only technology in cities. There's no human being in this picture. Next. So. When it comes to smart city solutions, what service providers need to understand, and sometimes the government as well needs to understand, is who are the actual paying customers? Now, the paying customers are the taxpayers. They are the ones who are paying taxes to the government to take care of them, provide them with a higher quality of life. So smart city solutions should always be quality of life driven, not ROI driven, not short-term economical gain. Next. So, there we go. So um, one of the fantastic things about our society today is that everyone is walking around with a phone in their pocket, which is basically a computer. It has never been easier to gather primary data from citizens than today. Sending out a simple survey or an app or how have you. So Smart Nation has done some initiatives on this in Singapore, actually. But in general, you cannot do anything without data. Right? When we do machine learning, deep learning projects with our uh, corporations that we work with, it's all about the data. The number one thing is always the data. So gathering that type of data is very, very important because if you don't have the data, you don't really understand what it is that your citizens want. And you'll be ending up making solutions that are not aligned with the needs of your citizens. Now the second point is, again, what is the problem statement? What are you trying to solve? What do you want to do? You want to make the lives better for your citizens. You want to make them uh, have better health care, uh, get to work easier, remove all the annoyances of life. Right? So understanding that means that you can actually go and figure out what it is that you should be doing, not just what is the shiny new thing. What is some technology that we want to use that would be cool to apply over here? Next. So one of the problems with that, though, is that if you're looking at smart city solutions, you typically talk about you know, 5, 10, 20 year plans to be able to build a smart city, which is a really big problem because the typical representative democratic election cycle does not provide that amount of uh, timeline, right? So if we, actually let me do this. <laughs> if we start up here, right? So you start with the election. And after the election, uh, you have to form a government. And me being Swedish, I don't know if you follow the news, but that took us six months this time. Um, after that, you plan and execute your policy. Great. But then, pretty soon, you have to worry about your re-election. Right? So we're talking about four years here, but in reality, there's only actually two years where the government is able to do anything of significance. So if you're trying to provide a smart city solution that's supposed to be implemented and make life easier for citizens, and it's going to take four or five years, you're never going to get approval. It's never going to go anywhere, and it's going to fail. Because in the end, uh, politicians also care about their own motives, which is getting re-elected, right? So we have the problem of, of maybe the incentives being wrong of doing this, and also we have the situation where we don't have an unlimited timeline. We know that we need to do it pretty quickly. So how can we take this and actually figure out a way to, to do this more efficiently and making something that is actually worthwhile? Next. So the key thing after the data, the primary data, is to reduce your scope, right? So uh, we have a lot of, of companies that have come to us and they have said, or countries and, and governments saying, give us smart city solutions. We want, uh, we want to do this and this and this. And we say, absolutely, we can do that. Uh, let's do a POC and get started, and we can have you something for you in, in three to six months. And they always say, no, 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 we want a product. Give us something that we can use now. And the problem with that is, I don't know uh, how well-versed everyone here is with machine learning and deep learning, but you cannot just take something and put it anywhere else. 
you have to, especially if you're talking about image recognition, object detection, you have to relearn it and you have to uh, continuously improve upon it. You cannot take it here and put it here. So what I did for this presentation actually is to kind of prove a point. I, uh, one of the questions that we've received from, from Vietnam, from Thailand, uh, and from, from companies in Singapore is may provide us with a, a smart parking solution as a smart city initiative. And uh, I said, well, yes, we can do that. And they said, no, we want it now. So I said to my, my fantastic data scientist, Jan Liguli, in, in Japan, I asked him, what can you do in five days? So next. So he said, challenge accepted. And he uh, went and he grabbed a open source model uh, and uh, open source data set. And you have all the information here on the right. But basically, he was able to build this model with a 96% accuracy rate in real time counting the open parking lots. And this is something that the, uh, has been requested, but no one wants to actually have to do themselves, right? Uh, next. Next, great. So, I think I'll better do this as well, right. So, to, to visualize this a little bit better, uh, if we have features to the top, we have time to the right. If this little building block was the model that we just built, Right? That's fantastic. That's a start. But it doesn't actually provide any value to anyone. It's just a cool technology, right? So how can we build upon this? Well, first of all, we can, we can maybe build a OCR reading uh, algorithm to capture the license plates of cars as they drive in to these parking lots and connect that to a system where they can pay automatically. Right? You don't have to use the, the, uh, the system that's being used right now. Uh, maybe we can add this to more parking lots. Great. And then we build an app on that where people can, in their area, see the open parking lots before they leave the office so they know where to go and go park, right? That's great. You provided some actual value. And now you have a smart parking solution. You do not have a smart city solution. You have a smart parking solution, a very small piece. So let's build upon that, right? Start thinking about more about what we can do. So if someone is at work, they want to go home, right? We can gather real-time traffic data, connect into this app and inform them of when they should be leaving the office, for example. We can build another predictive model that will route them where they should be going and uh, send them notifications as to you should be leaving work within these 30 minutes and you can park over here, right? That is a great solution that provides real value and now you have a smart mobility solution. You do not have a smart city solution, right? And then finally, keep on building like this, adding in libraries, adding in waste management, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, listening to the citizens. And finally, in the end, you will have something of value that you can actually call a smart city solution. But you don't have that now, and it's going to take a long time to get there. Right. So this is kind of where, where we come in. So we help companies to better understand this, hold their hand, and uh, hire the right people to do this internally. Right. So we used our technology to, to build the model that, we, uh, that I showed before very, very quickly uh, using annotation and, and uh, the deployment and inference and everything on our platform. So I'm not going to talk about that because uh, you can talk to me later if you want to know more about what we actually do. So to move on to that, I wanted to talk about an actual case that we've done, which is quite interesting. So we worked with Chubu Electric that I mentioned earlier, who is the second largest energy company in Japan, to do a uh, power disaggregation project. So what that means, to give you the background, first of all, I think everyone here knows that Japan had a pretty bad disaster, 2011, uh, Fukushima. And uh, what happened there is, is, in Japan, when a disaster like that happens, they shut down all the uh, nuclear reactors. Everything's shut down. And a very nice thing about Japan is that in order to restart those, you have to have an election so people can decide if they feel it's safe or not. So what happened is Japan has 54 nuclear reactors to power the entire company, country. <laughs> and only two reactors were allowed to restart, which means, I don't know if you've been in Japan, but they love using electricity. So they had a very big problem uh, and had to import all of that energy from abroad. So they imported it from China. They did a lot of interesting creative solutions to this. One is called CoolBiz, if anyone has heard of that. So yes, of course. Cool is basically the Japanese government made a fashion show for the salarymen of Japan 
saying that it's okay to wear a short sleeve shirt to the work. You don't have to wear a full suit. Because then they could cap the, the uh, air conditioning at a certain temperature. But you cannot just tell Japanese people that it's okay to not wear a suit. You have to, the government has to tell them that, for example. Right? Um, so uh, what Shubu approached us to do, they wanted to know what is people actually doing at home? What type of appliances are they actually using? So when they turn on the air conditioning, can they know that they turned on the air conditioning based upon the electrical current uh, that is being increased? So what we did with them, going back to the whole you know, smartphone idea I mentioned earlier, uh, we built a app for them, a web application for them, where, so the company had already installed smart meters in all of their facilities. So they had the electrical current. They knew exactly how the current would go up and down, but they didn't know what type of appliance. So we built this, and we provided it to, to households, and we said, here is some increase in electrical current. What appliance did you use here? And we asked them to go down, which shows 10 categories to make it simple, drop down menus, and they would go in on a daily or weekly basis and just saying, this is the type of appliances that we used. After a while, our model would learn the behavior of uh, the family, and then they would be able to say, you use an air conditioning here, you use the water heater here, et cetera, et cetera. And we were able to gather this because we gave some you know, incentives, some points for online purchasing uh, through Rakuten, I think it was. Um, and in the end, what we got was we received this estimated household appliance usage, basically. So it's not great, as you can see. The accuracy rate is, is not great. The reason for that is because it was a very warm summer, so not many people will be using their water heaters. But a lot of people use their air conditioning. So we've got a lot of data on air conditioning. So at a 92% accuracy rate, we could tell if someone turned on their air conditioning or not. And this was done in four months. So it doesn't take six months, a year, two years, five years, 10 years. It takes four months. If you actually reduce the scope and you understand what you're trying to achieve, and we're still gathering the data, and we're still improving upon this. This was then used for behavioral economics, if you know that concept. Uh, what we did was we said, look, you are a, a family of two. You have a dog in this area. And we're going to compare you on this uh, website that you log into and show you what type of electronics you're using compared to a similar household in the same area. And here you have the weather data, so you understand a little bit better as to why you would use more of something specific. And this is a really nice idea. But going back to the previous uh, concept of, of why did they do this, right? What value did this actually provide to the citizens? So you would assume that, well, we're using less electricity uh, because it's better for the world. And that would be great, but unfortunately, we live in a capitalistic society. And the reason for this was because uh, the company wanted to sell the electricity to corporations because they would pay more, right? So what this means is that this type of service was not built for the citizens in mind, right? So you as citizens need to take more action to make sure that in 20 years when you're living in a smart city, are the solutions and the technology that was developed actually for your benefit and your value and not just because some corporations wanted to make more money. So, to sum that up, basically, in three points. First, you need to understand who the actual paying customers are. Secondly, you need to reduce the scope. And then thirdly, you need to actually execute. And I didn't really touch on this that much, but uh, one of the key things that we have learned when we are working with, with corporations is always that you need uh, someone internally in the company that understands the problems, understands what the company has as in technology and how difficult it is in order to push internally. If you don't have that type of person, you will not be successful. So when it comes to uh, these, you know, for us as a company, we can always, when we say we enable AI, we enable machine learning and deep learning, right? That means that we can provide all the technology and all the support and all the consultancy in the world, but unless someone in the company understands this and really believes in and is willing to fight for it internally to make it happen, nothing will ever be successful. We call this person a champion. So my hope today is that wherever background you're from, that this concept sticks with you. And if you in the future want to do machine learning or deep learning in your company, either you can identify that champion or become that champion yourself. So yeah, technology is already here. What are you waiting for? Thank you.
I particularly like how you brought some of the challenges that exist. Uh, one of them that we heard was about the short election cycle, but I'm sure there's a lot more challenges out there. And from a user's perspective, I'd, I really want to hear, in terms of uh, everyone sitting here, what are the challenges you think are uh, applicable for your, for your lives as a smart city? I also really liked how you brought in part of the aspect of the solution being from uh, putting the onus on the people to reduce energy. Consumption, I, I think I read uh, in a statistic that 50% uh, of energy use in the United States is, comes from construction. So I think, you know, a, a putting the onus on people to shut off their lights, I think is fantastic. But when 50% of the use you know, in the United States comes from construction, what are we doing for that to actually make a difference? So I really like how you brought in that aspect of who's accountable and responsible for actually making uh, the biggest difference to the city. So uh, I'd like to open the floor to questions. Uh, with that in mind, in terms of challenges that you face, any sort of challenges in terms of what you want a smart city to look like? Uh, is there any particular questions to the implementation phase or anything that you have for David? Does anyone have a question for me? Yes? Yeah, hi. Very good presentation. Thank you very much. My name is Kaushik. David, I had a question around, you mentioned that in Japan, they were collecting data in terms of the sort of types of appliances which consumers are using at homes, et cetera. Now, as the world pivots towards um, uh, electric and new energies, essentially, the, you know, there will be more and more users during the peak hours uh, extracting energy from the grid. So in Japan, do you see specific pricing um, as incentives and also penalty during the peak hours where, you know, government gives uh, certain incentives to consumers to actually um, charge their vehicles or appliances during the off-peak hours as opposed to peaks to sort of manage the, you know, manage the load uh, on the grid. Do you see some sort of pricing incentives? So, I don't know of any initiative like that yet. Uh, I have read research on that as a concept. One of the problems uh, with dynamic pricing in, in, because that's what you mean, right? Yeah. yeah. With dynamic pricing is that uh, in Thailand, for example, uh, the electricity pricing is capped, and the government provides it. So if you and they are not allowing peer-to-peer -peer selling of electricity, uh, which means that even if you would want to do something like this, um, you're not gonna. It's, it's not gonna be very easy to implement it. Uh, you can, of course, provide these type of incentives, and I really believe that it's a great idea, um, but. You know, in, in the end, uh, is that really in the benefit of the company, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. No. So, so absolutely. But that's up to the. Do you? Do you uh, does the company have the data, right? It all goes down to the data. So, in that, in this specific case, uh, they only had the data on the electricity current. So, what we did was we connected the electricity current uh, increases or decreases to what type of appliance was used. And you know, one big problem with this is, of course, that it's a subjective data collection, right? We're asking someone um, after the event has actually occurred to recall what they did. So yes, you know, the accuracy might not be positive, but it, it provides a, a benchmark, kind of an idea of how people are using uh, appliances in their home. And the value of it as well is if you can figure this out, we don't have to install sensors in every single appliance that's being sold. So some companies do that right now, but in the end, you know, how often do you buy a new air conditioning, right? Sorry, I don't know if I answered the question. But <laughs> do we have any more? Uh, particularly, you, okay. Thanks. Um, just a, a small technical question on one of the charts. You mentioned about how um, the accuracy for uh, the air conditioner is 90%, mm. which means, I guess, one out of 10 cases, it's actually not an air conditioning system, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Just out of curious, because I'm, I'm curious as to how it works internally, how do you verify that it is, that 90% is the, the correct number? You don't go door to door and check if an air conditioning is on, right? So, yeah, like, <laughs> this is, yeah, just curious on, on how that, you come to that figure and for the other appliances as well. Yeah, so, so we, we of course built a, a data set internally, you know, turning it on and off different appliances, uh, seeing the electric current changing to, to verify it. Uh, but in the end, like I mentioned, one of the biggest, you know, it's, this is very interesting, but in the end, we don't really know how accurate it is because we asked people to actually tell us when they turned on the air conditioning versus not, right? Okay. 
So the 90% is in itself a bit of an estimate as well? Then. Exactly. Okay. Right. Okay, thank you. Is there any more questions? Yeah, we got one more? We got time for, yeah, one more question. Thank you. Um, I come from um, utility, I work for utility in Germany, so maybe first to uh, answer the other part of the question about dynamic pricing, that does exist in many countries around the world. France is a very, very good example of that. Uh, France has been doing dynamic pricing for many years. My question is about data privacy. So we've been trying to implement the same things in Europe, but we have this nice GDPR, and now it's a nightmare. So yes. can you elaborate in Japan what is the current framework, and is, uh, do you expect things to evolve in, in terms of privacy? Mm. Thank you. So Japan is a little bit more lenient than Europe, which basically everyone is. Um, and uh, there is more concern on data privacy in Japan, but in general, Japan is, is it, it's not really being talked about in this sense, because the Japanese culture is very different in that. Uh, so uh, right now we're allowed, so we have a, a retail solution where we basically do Google Analytics uh, in retail. So we put cameras in stores, people coming in, grabbing demographic data, analyzing how they behave in the store, et cetera, right? So uh, in Singapore, we can only put those cameras inside of, of the store, but in Japan, we're actually allowed to put them facing the street, right? So we can also see the conversion rate of people coming in versus not, right? So Japan has, it's, it's, it's not really a concern, but there's gonna have to happen, like similar like in, in, in uh, how happened in the West, there's gonna have to be some sort of scandal for Japanese people to actually start to, to change their mindset, but right now, there hasn't really been a scandal, and, and for them, the fact that Facebook is targeting with ads, stuff like that, is, it's a concern, but it's not really a concern. If that makes Thank sense. You. But I do believe, personally, that even though the, the GDPR is a nightmare, I think it's the rest step in the right direction. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, th thank you, David, yeah, and thank you thank for your, your questions as well. Particularly love the fact that you're able to share some real examples, too. I love the parking lot example of what can be done in five days. So I hope everyone here can take a little bit away with some practical solutions and, and maybe some, uh, some things to think about in terms of uh, not just privacy, but uh, in smart cities in general. So thank you very much, David. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, next, we have Sam Conrad Joyce of Singapore University of Technology and Design. And Sam is doing some very interesting work, which is often, uh, I would say, on the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of AI. So a lot of people say, AI is going to come take our jobs. They're going to come replace our task. But Sam here is actually working with AI hand in hand. So uh, Sam's an architect and doing a generative design. And he's going to show us something very special where you can actually work with AI to create something. So not replacement, but augmentation. So I will let Sam take it away because he's much more qualified to explain what he's doing. So please put your hands together for Sam. Technology wins. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can we have the video? Oh, next. So just as a bit of an introduction, um, I work in architecture. Um, prior to being an assistant professor at SUTD, which is a university in Singapore that got set up by MIT, um, I, was, uh, I worked in computational design for a firm called Foster & Partners, a chap called Norman Foster. Um, or Lord Norman Foster, if you're British and you respect that sort of thing. Um, can we play it? Um, so I'm interested in how we can be co-creators with computers. Um, I don't believe that computers are going to take over architecture and, and creative jobs. Um, but I'm interested in the modes that this could happen. So this is a little tool that's kind of live on the web now. If you look at my my uh, lab's uh, web, address, uh, web address, which is metadesignlab.com. Uh, this is a tool, kind of a little bit of a toy, really, which shows how we can automatically generate new solutions. So um, this is a simple user interface. But what we're using here is an underlying 
sort of programming sort of paradigm called parametric modeling. Um, and we're using something called Cartesian genetic programming, which is sort of building models automatically. Um, so what this is able to do is we're able to control the, the complexity of the model. For example, here we have a very complex network, and it can create literally very complex designs. Um, we can also change uh, the kind of components that we're, we're using. So if we have a very simple network, in this case it has a lot of depth, so things are very connected. However, um, we have low layers, so the, the design is kind of simple. Um, and what we can also do is we can mutate this design, so we can sort of introduce small changes to it. There's, there's actually a sort of uh, a relatively simple representation of it, and we can make small modifications uh, to that. Um, so this, this approach is what we're interested in in terms of enabling computation and, and AI to sort of do its own creative processes. So rather than just taking data in from external sources, we're interested in how we can empower the computer to do something interesting and, and different in this way and have control over it. So what we can see here is that we're able to control, in this place, just like the simple statistical distribution of these, of these types of components. Um, so we're very interested in this because if the rules are implemented correctly, it can make very valid designs very, very quickly. And typically, these kind of design things will take you know, uh, half a day or a few hours to produce and even longer to kind of develop in CAD. So this kind of level of creativity is quite interesting to us. Um, maybe if we can show the next video. Is that plausible? Um, the problem with this is that I sort of call this a bit like you know, the little six-year-old child that keeps making nice, pretty paintings for you that you put on the fridge. You know, and you go, oh, isn't that nice? And like, can you make daddy a little bit thinner? He's not that fat and you know, that kind of stuff, right? Um, so essentially what we have here, and I think that's kind of true for a lot of machine learning, is a kind of a bit of an autistic six-year-old, if that's not un PC to say, right? And the question is how do we kind of socialize them so that they're more able to produce things that are kind of socially aware and they're more what people want, right? Uh, so in architecture, that's definitely a problem that we can sort of devise computers and computer systems which can build all kinds of geometry, but how do we make meaning out of them is, is very sort of problematic. Um, so this is a little tool um, which is a sort of a proof of concept, but this is kind of looking specifically at floor plans, so floor plans for small apartments and things like that. And this tool enables you to produce a bunch of designs, or the computer to produce a bunch of designs, and then you can vote on the ones you like. So in this case, we could argue that the person here is interested in making a nice building with a courtyard. They're like fans of courtyards. They like these kind of, these kind of designs. So they're voting on them. They're just saying, oh, I like this, I like this, I like this, right? And then what we do is we say, eventually once we're sort of bored of that, we can update the solution. We go, okay, this is my top 10 or whatever. And then the system will make new solutions. Um, and what it's trying to do here is it's trying to learn what the preferences are at a very, very high level. Um, and the way that it kind of measures that are quite varied, and that's a part of our research of how do we explore actually you know, what these things are and, and how do we measure them. But what's interesting is that even over this kind of relatively short interaction process, if you keep it going, you can begin to see that it's sort of learning that I should produce designs with a courtyard, right? Like it sort of roughly gets it. Um, and as you sort of interact with it more, you can become more and more specific. So there's an inherent kind of convergence in this approach. Um, but you can also sort of over the design process kind of change your mind and it will sort of gradually unlearn things. So this is sort of based on, on the kind of the way that the, um, the machine learning um, is, is put together. Um, but essentially it's trying to sort of satisfy the designer's, um, you know, or the, the person's uh, use case. So for us, for us, we're quite interested in this because it keeps the person inside the design process. Um, and we think this is very important because architecture is not just a functional requirement. It's not about making a super efficient building. Ultimately, for example, buildings um, are measured relative to other buildings. So I worked pr previously on the Apple headquarters when I was at Foster and Partners, and we couldn't sell the same building to Google, for example, because uh, Google would not want the same building as Apple, right? Even if that was a really good design and we'd spent a lot of time on it. So this is why the human preferences for things is incredibly important. So we're sort of interested in these kind of more democratic ways of doing this. What's more interesting about this is that this learning system 
is the same for every user. So actually what we can then do is we can then begin to aggregate all the users of this system and we can get a wider learning of what the preferences are for a certain floor plan. So one of the things we're interested in using this for is for developments of, for example, high-rise, where often you split the number of floor, uh, the room layouts into sort of four or five, right? So we'd be able to sort of cluster analysis this and produce a series of designs which are much closer aligned to what users want. But they do that through exploring their own needs rather than um, actually being offered a few sort of very specific designs. So we're kind of interested in this, in this as a sort of creative approach to, to using AI. That's it. Um, they're online. Have a look. Have a play. Please. Yep. We have a, let me grab this. OK, we have time for one or two questions for Sam, uh, specifically about what he's doing here. Because I think it's super interesting that you know, it, as an example of how you can work with machines rather than them replacing, especially, uh, you know, given the impl implications for what you can do in terms of smart cities. Uh, you, have, you have a question for Sam? Yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, that's, that's really interesting. It reminds me very much, I yeah. like Sam, I right. those. Okay. okay. That's a really, really interesting question. Um, so the question is about where does the creativity lie, essentially? It, does, it, does it lie with the architect or, or the designer? Um, or the, the AI sort of designer? I think it's collaborative. Um, I mean, essentially, this machine can make a bunch of things, right? It can make technically an infinite number of possible combinations. It can do all, all the combinations. It doesn't know what anything wants, though, right? It doesn't know what that is. So, I would argue that the creativity for what the needs are come from the user, right? So what I'm interested in here is a dialogue between the computer, which is able to produce things, and this takes ages, right? You know, as a, you know, as a student, I spent ages on CAD trying to do all the little room layouts and so on. Um, so this, this sort of takes the time to do, but it's actually the kind of analytical skills of being able to say, this is a good design or this is a bad design. Yeah, discrimination. I actually think this is often a sort of a, a question that comes up about are we limiting creativity? And I would argue yes. Um, but you need to do it. As, as an, you know, in, in architecture, we have this problem that like, oh, we're limiting creativity. But in the end of the day, you need a building which you know, protects you from the sun and the rain. Right? There are a whole bunch of other options with like roofs completely open. I know my students make them every month, and I tell them off for it. Right? So ultimately, Buildings have to be somewhat functional, and they, they, are, they are constrained. And I think the constraints is not something to kind of hide away from. So actually, the human being is creatively coming up with the constraints for the machine. So I, I view it very much as a sort of a two-way street, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, does it, another, one more question? OK, this will be the last one. Please state your name as well. Um, sorry. So I work in the B2C business, and I don't really understand about architectures and buildings. From my observation, um, when you are designing uh, any architecture until when the consumer or ultimate customers live in there, that's probably a few years interaction. And the customers are not identified until very late in the process whether you buy your own house or whether it's for commercial usage. Therefore, my hypothesis on this would be it could be great designs. However, the developers or the construction companies have a strong influence on it. Um, they want to get the most economic value out of it rather than flexibility for consumers. How would you propose that we overcome this um, challenge? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a really, really interesting question. Um, Great question. And it strikes at the heart of a very complex set of interactions between finally moving into a building and the people that make it, the building, the people that design it, and the people that finance it. Um, I've got to admit, uh, Foster's I've been relatively lucky because we've had people like Steve Jobs who have come up to us and said, hey, I want a building, right? And that's a very great, great bit of carte blanche for doing what you want and actually talking to the people. And this is actually a bit where some of this stuff comes from, that we were working on the Bloomberg headquarters in London and also the Apple headquarters in Calpertino. And what was amazing about that was being able to talk to the people in the offices, right? And of course, the money comes into it, um, although Apple headquarters at five billion wasn't exactly cheap. Um, but it was, what was kind of interesting about that is actually being able to understand them. So some of what this is doing is actually looking at a way through technology to reach beyond that classical problem of developers want to make money. And, and that's very important that, that um, architecture and, and building design is, is, is buoyant as an industry. Um, we get more jobs that way. Um, however, the, the developers are also aware of their sort of lack of knowledge of what the market wants as well. They, I would argue, equally worried about this, this problem. So what's interesting about these tools is it offers us an opportunity to kind of not exactly leapfrog, but then actually integrate and talk to the, uh, to the potential users. And granted, that might be in a couple of years. But often, there's quite a lot of buy-in to, you know, if you help co-create the design, then maybe you're more interested in buying it because it suits you better, right? So we're very interested in how do we use technology in a way that's efficient so that we can actually reach out to our potential users because typically this just isn't done. Um, there's not a productive way of reaching out to people. Uh, Singapore is a, a great example because obviously the HDB system, people, you know, 80% of the people here know who they're going to be buying their house from. So that's a very interesting model for us. Um, so, yeah, so we're sort of interested in this as a way of actually building data about what people want, but not doing it in a kind of kicker design ABC, which is very restrictive. Instead, it's like, play with this to toy. And through doing that, we get information about what people want. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It did. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay, th thank you, Sam. Much appreciated. And excellent question. <clears throat> okay, now I'd like to invite the panelists up. Can we have uh, Nicole, Kamal? Yep, do you, are you going to be around, or are you going to be here? Do you want to? Do you want to? Now it's working. Okay, yeah, that's working. Okay. Yeah, Okay. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. I'll stand. I'll stand. Okay, we have an esteemed group of, uh, you know, smart city experts here. I'm very, very pleased to have everyone here on this panel. I hope that we can uh, have a bit of a town hall feel where we can get to some some issues and challenges. Like I said, so I've all I've prepared them that you're going to ask them tough questions. So I want to make sure that we. Uh, we, uh, we get to some truth. And I like, so far, we have some, some, some great examples. Um, but for, for those of you who, who haven't met, um, I, I'd like to just make sure, like, Kamal, would you mind introducing yourself a little bit first um, and just you know, tell us a little bit about your background? Mm -hmm. and, and, and then uh, you can tell us about one of your case studies that you're working on, maybe one of the ones that we talked about earlier. And uh, just introduce yourself to, to everyone here so they get familiar. And then, Nicole, you can do the same after, OK? Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kamal Manar. Um, I lead the Applied Intelligence Center of Excellence for Accenture in Singapore. So part of my role is look at how do we apply AI for our clients across industry. Um, so we look at emerging technologies, look at client problems, and try to meet it. Right. That's basically what I what I do. My background: I have a PhD in uh, operations research. Uh, worked in GE for a few years. Um, joined Accenture six seven years ago. So. I, at the core, I'm a, I'm a data scientist. I like data, playing with data, building algorithms, and so on. Um, so I think the example that I wanted to talk about um, kind of lines up with, our, with what our first speaker was, was saying. You know, to me, smart nations is about people, right? Um, and one of the ways you can use data is to understand what are the citizen needs 
and then, and then be more proactive in terms of how, as a government, you react to it. So this is something that globally different government agencies are doing, and also in Singapore, right? So if, if you break it down, there are three aspects to it, right? The first is, you know, um, when you have a problem, let's say you have mosquito breeding issues in your neighborhood, um, you would pick up a phone and call someone. That's what used to be earlier, right? And traditionally, you know, the way governments are, are structured, there are different agencies. So you would need to know whom should I call. So in the Singapore context, you know, should I call NEA or should I call whom should I actually call, right? Um, so that results in a slower response in terms of from a government perspective. So one of the ways in which you can solve it is basically build a natural language processing AI engine that looks at what the person is saying, understand the context of what the person is saying, and then figure out from the past data which agencies have actually worked together to solve this problem. So you basically short circuit the entire process and you solve that person's problem as quickly as possible. So that's one. The second is, you know, if you have the whole wealth of data of past you know, calls from citizens and so on, so you could analyze that, bring in weather data, bring in other sources of information, operational data from the agencies, and use that to predict what is going to happen, spatiotemporally. So in this case, it's about where and when. So if you can predict where and when an issue is going to happen, you can actually reduce the need for the citizen to pick up the phone and call, right? So you actually reduce that aspect. And the last is, again, going back to the app um, example that, that you were saying earlier, is how do you make it as easy as possible for people to basically contact the government? So you don't have to pick up a phone and call. You could have an app. You take a photograph, and then you basically send that photograph off. You could have deep learning engine at the back end that processes that image, figures out what, what, what's actually happening, right? Actually, all of these things, if you look at it, I don't know how many of you use the municipal services app that in, has been built in Singapore by, by the government. It actually has all these elements in there. So that, to me, is a great example of how do you look at it from a smart nation's perspective. So that's a quick intro and, and one example that, that I think uh, that I'm passionate about. Great. Thank you, Kamal. Uh, so would it be fair to say that you know, the, the way that you're going to get information from your citizens is through that app? Would that be one of the barriers to a smart city that you're thinking about right now? So I think, I think just as I think somebody was talking about customers, right? So if you think of citizens as customers, the whole idea is how do you simplify the entire process and have that stickiness, right? Okay. So one of the cool things that, again, taking the same municipal services example is they have a parking app. So those of you who drive in Singapore, I think that's a great app that was built. To, it tells you, again, I have to park in 30 minutes. Where should I go? And so on. So you, you actually provide services around that. Mm -hmm. So it maintains that stickiness. And then, therefore, people start using the app not just to park, but to provide feedback and so on and so forth, right? So it, it has to be very much focused on, on the citizen. OK. How, how many here live in Singapore? Pretty much everyone? Does, has anyone used the app? I'm trying to You're trying to download it? <laughs> OK. Yes, yeah, one service. So that's the app that was developed okay. by IDA. So I think if, you, if, you, if you're parking, it's, it's a great example, but I think it does other things as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, one of the things that we can do here in this uh, forum is to give people actionable steps where they can get involved. And so if there's a, a waiver, you can give the government some of your information on how a smart city is going to be designed. I think we should give people that opportunity. Yep. So thank you, Kamal. Uh, ne next, I would like uh, Nicole from Airbus to maybe give us a brief introduction about yourself and tell us you're doing some amazing things uh, on uh, smart cities, especially with drones. Maybe you can share a little bit of that example with uh, everyone here. I'm sure everyone's uh, keen to hear. Okay, um, my name is Nicole Leong, I'm from Airbus, and uh, heading up digital thing, uh, transformation, but for Southeast Asia, so I don't think it's uh, that specific here. <laughs> uh, my background, um, uh, previously I was at ASTAR, the Agency for Science, Technology and Research here in Singapore, and prior to that, uh, I was actually in investment banking. Uh, my undergrad degree is actually in mechanical engineering, and then I did my MBA here at INSEAD. Okay. So, uh, that's, uh, that's how I sort of rolled into the whole technology thing, just interest, essentially, because there's yeah. no, not much connect there. Um, so at Airbus, uh, we have quite a few smart uh, city initiators. Of course, it's things that fly, because uh, that's what we do. And uh, one of which we're actually pilot we've been piloting in Singapore. It's called Skyways. And uh, what it does is essentially it's a drone that delivers a parcel from uh, point A to point B. Uh, we have actually been doing, our trials actually have been far out in Tuas area, so nobody really sees it at this point. Uh, we're also doing maritime um, uh, drone deliveries. And also if eventually we're gonna move into in inner city within Singapore. 
So uh, there is, it, it's pretty exciting, and, but there is a lot of uh, pieces to the puzzle that still need to be uh, put together to make it uh, work in the city. But at the moment, we're doing a ship to shore um, use case, which basically transfer, instead of using a boat, you have a drone now that does it. So I don't know if you want me to go into the details on any issues that we're having, uh, the amount of crashes that we had to get this far. But uh, it has been very exciting, and I, I would say it is not very easy, and there's a lot of things that you also need to take in co into consideration when you're looking into doing something like this. Of course, there is a, it's very exciting, and, and it's something that people have sort of a, a bit of a touch and feel to already, yeah. which is you know the DJI drones, which are the recreational drones. But the drones I'm talking about, of course, is the industrial drones. So we're, we're talking about maybe one and a half, two meter drones, octocopters that can carry about three kilos of payload. They go a lot faster, you know, five, six meters a second. It follows a, a route, and of course it's autonomous. So the idea is not to have a uh, drone pilot on this at all. So one big component of it is actually the urban air traffic management system. So one drone in the air is fine. You, know, you just look out for each other. Two drones, yeah, try to avoid the birds as well. But once you, you move up and you have a lot more drones in the sky, you, you need a proper system. And uh, this system we need to look at now before it gets there. Uh, that's that's uh, one of the issues that we face. But also there's the technology, there's the battery power. There is, uh, if the batteries catch fire, what happens when it falls into the water? Um, is it recyclable? So there is uh, there quite a lot of things um, that we also do look into that. So. That is just one of that. Of course, eventually, we're going to move on to flying taxi. I think uh, they're also testing it. But it's Rollercopter that's testing it in Singapore and not uh, Airbus at this point. Airbus is trying to do a more of a modular system where uh, we're partnering with Audi. Audi does the car portion, and uh, Airbus does this sort of uh, add-on module that picks it up and uh, transports the, the individual, I think is a two-seater, out to wherever they want to go. Usually it's a specific landing area because, of course, infrastructure is another thing that we need to look at, where you can land, which buildings or which areas would be uh, suitable. But yeah, so you can ask more questions about that later. I think uh, I've tried to cover as much as I could. That's, that's fascinating. Thank you, thank you Nicole. Um, just, just on that note, uh, from the users that you have, and the people that uh, you've been implementing this with, what is the, the, the biggest sort of fears or pushback? Is it the, you, said, you mentioned the noise, you mentioned the, you know, the, maybe, maybe the, uh, the intrusiveness, but from the user's point of view, uh, what's the biggest pushback so far in terms of the implementation of, of this technology? User pushback, I mean, in terms of uh, the flying taxi, uh, first, there's no pilot on that. It's an yeah. autonomous yeah. flying taxi is what we're trying to push for. And uh, so, yeah, user pushback would be, you know, fear. Because when you get on, imagine getting on a plane with no pilot. Yeah. It's completely possible to do, but uh, you, you need, you, you feel a bit more secure with a guy there <laughs> um, or a lady yeah. there flying the plane. Um, in terms of the drone, I would say there's the noise factor. I don't know, if has, has anybody heard the, the drones? They're pretty noisy. Uh, they're not that silent, so there's the noise factor and also the crowding of the skies. So right now, you know, you can look up, it's a nice clear sky, maybe occasionally you see a plane go by, but um, if you're going to look up and see a lot of drones flying around, you know, it kind of ruins the landscape a little bit, and also the time, the, a lot of pushback within uh, the, the time. You know, in yeah. the evening, you, I mean, drones are autonomous anyway, so it doesn't really matter what time it is, but in the evening, people want to go home and relax, and of course, there's also the issue if it falls out of the sky, yeah. which is not supposed to happen ideally. But even if it doesn't fall on a person, it's, it's still an issue because it could have fell yeah. on a person. And I think uh, this is something that, I wouldn't say most cities, I would say all cities have zero tolerance for. So there is a, a lot of testing and that's the main push that, back that we get. So of course, regulators need to take this into account and um, make sure that it's super safe, but it's of course very hard to guarantee 100% safety. So I think uh, that's, that would be a big criteria in where uh, in going forward in this drone technology. Thank you. Maybe we can ask the audience a little bit. Does, 
anyone have any fears about drones or flying taxis or anything like that? How many are uh, anticipating the implementation of these technologies? Yes? We have a yes. How many people want these technologies? Uh, who has fears of these technologies? And some undecided. Okay, any, anyone have any fears or, or, or issues that you want to share for, for Nicole? You could ask her. Yes? Uh, I live just near uh, Paya Labar Air Base, so I actually often hear the military drones, and they're pretty noisy. Um, what sort of technology do you think you'll have in place? Because I, I know, like with even with renewables and wind farms, that people have complained about the noise. Uh, there's environmental issues around wildlife running into drones. Uh, do you sort of get any pushback, I guess, in in that regulatory space? And then, is there a technology answer for some of the uh, questions around the, the noise and and keeping them sort of, I guess, I mean, people like the convenience of the drones, but then if it's going to be listening to drones constantly through the night, then that's going to get a bit disturbing. Okay, so yeah, as I said, so far we're not allowed to do it at night, um, fly drones, that is. And um, so your question was about wildlife and also uh, the military drones, right? So military drones are not electric. So the drones that we're looking at, the more socially accepted drones, are your electric engine drones with autonom uh, autonomous electric drones. And um, so I would say that's a difference. Military drones also have a far higher payload. So they're carrying a lot of you know, military stuff uh, on those drones, uh, highly confidential stuff. And uh, they do a lot of surveillance as well, these military drones. And, I, I wouldn't lie, I'm going to tell you that uh, in Airbus, a lot of the technology for our current drones are also taken from the military side of Airbus, but not the electrical part. So we are having a lot of uh, electrics, um, electric uh, engines. So I would say that's a difference. In terms of wildlife, um, there is not a lot of data on this at the moment. Of course, I mean, if we, if we extrapolate from aircraft data, uh, a big thing, of course, is the bird strikes. But a bird versus a uh, A380 versus a bird versus a, a one and a half meter drone, uh, I mean, the effects are different. And um, I don't know, we, we do apply a bit of a survival of the fittest um, <laughs> for this. Uh, a little bit of AI on these uh, birds would have to be applied. But um, that's, that's where, where we'll be looking. And to be honest, yeah. We're not uh, super concerned about the flying wildlife. But in terms of if you're talking about say, clearing a forested area to have a landing pad, then no, that's, that's not the, the way we're going to execute um, um, landing in a suburban place or in farms or even looking at agriculture. It will be more of a, a, drop, a drop situation rather than a landing situation. Uh, next question is for the, the anyone on the panel, but uh, Sam and David, if you want to ask, that would be great. Uh, so we talked about behavioral uh, capabilities and digital capabilities. My my question to everyone is, you know, how can we merge these two things? Uh, so how can digital capabilities support behavioral capabilities and behavior in general within a smart city and within each of your areas? You know, what is, what is happening digitally that can then support, you know, the human behavior aspect of a smart city? And uh, how are those two things related? So either to Sam or... I guess I can talk a bit to that. Um, I mean, I think architecture is inherently concerned with behavior, how people enjoy space and so yeah. on. It's, it's not always our role to make sort of hyper-efficient, structurally safe buildings. Our kind of primary concern is about making things that are interesting and engaging. Um, I mean, there's, there's been discussions about buildings which, you know, even since sort of cybernetics and a chap called Cedric Price, um, about sort of buildings that can reconfigure and uh, I guess respond to buildings, which is kind of very exciting and very interesting. Um, some of the original kind of thoughts that 
um, people like Thomas Heatherwick had for the Google complex. The implementations of those are very difficult. You know, like buildings are inherently big things, um, and moving around, moving them around, and having them reconfiguring is 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 problematic. Um, the reason I sort of talk about that is, I suppose, currently with a lot of AI, there's this sort of surveillance culture, you know. Um, and from my own work, some of that is useful, right? Like we're we're using Twitter meet, Twitter data. We've got you know projects for URA, you know, kind of looking into how do we consume this sort of feedback, this social data in a way that can help design. But currently, it's very passive in the sense that we're looking at how people behave in existing contexts, and then we're looking to see how can we learn from that and build something new. Um, and the reason I bring up kind of reconfigurability is that it would be nice to think about a future where the building itself is able to do this. Um, you know, there's, there's some relatively kind of famous and sort of interesting work um, over at RMIT and, and at the Architecture Association in London, which kind of looked into these ideas of like a building getting bored and just sort of modifying its, its, its kind of situation so that it could kind of interact with people, um, which I think are very, very interesting, but that's like really far off, you know. Mm. Um, so in terms of sort of designing future buildings, currently we're in this kind of slightly kind of uh, sort of world where we're sort of observing people and trying to kind of react on that. But that's kind of the next building, as it were. Um, yeah, so, it, but it would be nice to kind of move away from that and actually have the building actually be able to kind of interact with its users and essentially begin a sort of conversation, as it were, between those. For, for us, that's an interesting possibility in the future, yeah. Thank you, Sam. Do you, do you believe that uh, the building design itself can enhance incl uh, inclusivity or maybe you know, uh, you know, help, help change behavior in some way for the positive, um, for perhaps maybe increasing human interactions or something like that? Is that something that we want to aspire to do within uh, the designs for our smart cities? Yeah, I, I really hope so. I, you know, I think, I mean, that's one of the, one of the big drivers towards sort of surveillance and big data within buildings of seeing how do people interact. You know, there are interesting met, like metrics. Um, Bill Hillier um, also did, a with Space Syntax, did a lot of interesting work looking into how people interact in cities and how the network of both cities and, and buildings kind of result in different interactions. Um, the, the worry that I have in terms of when you're talking about inclusivity yeah. is often these metrics are aggregated. You know, they, they represent the kind of total of the interactions, right? Um, and I think the danger with that is that obviously, you know, you're not talking about the edge cases or inclusivity. You're talking about the majority of people. Um, and in architecture, we have to quite carefully consider this, you know, like, you know, for example, even this, this, you know, uh, this room here has to have spaces for wheelchair users, right? And I don't know if big data would pick that up, right? But they're very important things to design. Yeah. You know, how do people get there? How can they, you know, um, these are things that we have to worry about. There's a great site in Sweden, actually, which is like uh, wheelchair access put in afterwards. So architects didn't think about wheelchair access and how that completely mucked up beautiful pieces of architecture. Um, so again, this is often because we just think about the standard case. And big data has a very you know, strong force towards pushing like, a majority mm. view, I suppose. Um, and in architecture, that's often not the problem. It's, it's all the kind of edge cases, which actually we have to think about. Yeah, so that's a bit of a cautionary worry about approaching these kind of smart cities, is that they don't respect that, you know, those edge cases. Thank you, Sam. And Kamal, do you have yeah, something so, to add? So I think you know, if, if you think of combination of digital and behavior, to me, behavior is kind of nudge kind of behavior, right? We're sending the right message at the right time for people to change their behavior. And for example, you could look at, from a smart, smart city perspective, look at how do you get people to exercise more by nudging yeah. them towards the right behavior, by looking at other types of data, 
having the right forms of, you know, for you to walk, are the, is there the right infrastructure in place and so on, but also what do people like to do and nudge them at the right time to do the right thing. The only cautionary side of combining behavior and data is, I was reading an article by New York Times a few years back, how Uber is using a combination of data and behavior to get the drivers to drive more for them while minimizing incentives, right? Because they, they know what triggers you, know, you to drive more, and they can therefore give you less incentives. So behavior and data can be used for positive things, but can equally be used for, for, for things that are not so good as well. So you have to be careful how you combine these two together. Maybe you can ask the, uh, the audience here. Are, are, is, is, are people scared about uh, you know, smart cities driving your behavior? Is there some behavioral you know, sort of uh, influences that you're uh, happy with and other ones that maybe you're not? Does anyone have any ideas about want to make this as interactive as possible? So, yes? Developmental projects, I don't know, um, anywhere in the world where we can actually use land that we cannot live before, maybe in the deserts or in a colder environment, or if there are any projects where um, it's designed for a senior citizen city or environment some, as a study case or a prototype. Because I think if we're trying to change a city where it's already metropolitan, people like it as is you need a strong force to change behavior, either in terms of benefit or risk. So I'm curious what other projects there is around for smart cities under the sea or anything. That's a shiny button that's a social influencer. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe I can talk a little bit to that. Um, at SUTD, we're really interested in these, quest you know, these kind of questions. And Singapore is a great forum for thinking about these ideas because you know, land is so scarce and so on. So, I mean, I've literally got uh, a master's student at the moment looking at floating airports. Um, how do we do that? You know, um, and at the moment we're borrowing very heavily from, you know, kind of uh, uh, ships, you know, kind of like uh, uh, ships that uh, have landing strips on them and so on. Um, I'm a little bit worried about this kind of idea of smart cities cures all, because that's an engineering problem. You know, like these kind of things about, and so on. And I think, I think we shouldn't disrespect kind of a lot of these really interesting things that are kind of happening in that field, because shoving a few sensors on something is not going to solve whether a city floats or sinks, right? Um, but maybe there's a way of thinking about it a bit more, right? Like, you know, if, if we can, you know, utilize that space better, or we can say how you know, by providing land in a certain space that we can do something quite radically different to that neighborhood or, you know, achieve things, then it becomes much more viable. Um, you know, there was, there was an amazing time kind of in the 80s where so many proposals in Japan and Tokyo Bay specifically were coming up about, you know, floating cities and, and things like that. Um, and that was all to do with the kind of incredible increase in cost of land. Um, but I think, you know, as there becomes more pressure on land, then it, it, it enables some very interesting things to happen. Um, but I feel that they're like, you know, they're kind of engineering design problems before they're smart, smart city problems. But then maybe I'm over constraining the definition of smart city. I don't, I don't know. Well, that's a great idea, actually. What is the definition of smart cities? I mean, we've already talked about it as being a broad, you know, a basket of technologies and I think David uh, explained quite well in his presentation. But uh, it's very interesting here to hear, like, what is the smart city that we want to design? And uh, do we actually play a role in designing that smart city? So maybe just to, you know, to have that idea as what a smart city is. He was actually first, but uh, yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah, Still, yeah. OK, perfect. I'll get you next. Thank you. My name's Craig Duncan. My question really is for David, but it has to do with what Nicole was saying. Um, you know, in the middle of the 19th century, Osman just bulldozed his way through Paris to make way for these wonderful boulevards that we say today, we see today. Um, and one of the issues I think I have with the piecemeal approach, David, is that is the, the, the democratic consultation. How do you consult with people to find out what type of city they really want? Uh, and the reason why I'm asking the question is that when you read books like Homo sapiens or 
homo deus or whatever, the point that he makes is that you never go back to previous technologies. So you introduce drones, which is just one small piece of the whole equation, and then all of a sudden they're there, people accept them and you move on to something else. But who is it who says, well, drones is actually an important beneficial part of the way we want our city to be? So is there, is there something is there something we're missing here about consulting people as to what the holistic picture should be, as opposed to, you know, from a technology perspective, it makes sense to introduce things piecemeal because that's how you do it, given the election cycle. But what about the bigger picture? Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so I, th I think uh, the idea, uh, when it comes to, to kind of gathering this type of information from citizens is, uh, right, you're saying, right, citizens are, they don't, might not really know what they want. They don't have the technological understanding maybe to be able to provide this type of like, this is what we want in the future, right? Um, but at the same time, uh, if we just continue the way that we are doing, uh, the concern is that you, we will end up in a future that we don't actually want, right? Uh, so not only gathering, you know, of course you cannot just listen to everyone in, in a democratic way and just be like, everyone just give me your information and we'll do what you want, right? You have to still, um, you know, make a judgment call somehow. But it's, it's, I think it's important that we keep on gathering this information from, from citizens, right? Because a great example is, is uh, have you been to Stockholm? Yeah. So Stockholm used to be very, very beautiful. The center of you used to be very beautiful. Yeah. Ah, can be argued. Uh, so, so what they did is around, around the central city, uh, right, the, in the 70s, they decided that uh, this type of new design style, which is very boring, kind of gray, uh, they decided that this is what we're going to do now. So they completely demolished the entire center of Stockholm and they rebuilt this very boring, bland uh, type of, of buildings, right? Um, because that was the, what the, the socialist government at the time believed that we should be striving towards. Everyone is equal, etc. And now we look back at those type of buildings that were demolished, it's, it's really, really sad, right? Mm. Uh, but then you look at cities like Barcelona, uh, who kind of, they also, you know, you need to build new buildings, but they always keep the facade, right? So they demolish the building, but they keep the facade, right? So um, I think if we let governments just use data on behavior of people to, to make judgment calls for us, is not necessarily what we want as, as a society, right? So. Um, you can. You should not only look at the data, but you should also think about what can. You know, what else is there to it? I think is very important. Does that make sense? Somehow. <laughs> and also, what's driving it, right? Like, is it the economic drivers, or is it to you know the benefit of the citizens? Yeah, like, because or, but if you look at the behavioral data, right? You're never like people behave like this for a reason. If you have designed the city in this way, they are behaving this way, right? So if you just look at that data and say, oh, this is what people want. Right? No, they, it's not actually what they want. They've just adapted to the circumstances that's provided to them. So you could do this in a much better way, but if you just look at the data, you're not going to be actually providing value to the citizens. You're just going to make a, a, a bad situation worse. Well, you look like you have something to add. Uh, no, I was just, just thinking about uh, kind of different examples. So I don't know if it's true or not. Uh, maybe you can tell me. So one story that I heard, which is, you know, some universities set up a new campus, and they didn't actually have any, any footpaths or pathways for people. And, and they basically let, it, let people decide, right? So people always find the shortest path to go from building A to building B. They figure out how people walk, and then based on that, they essentially set up the pathway. So that's a way of actually, like what you're saying, right? If you put the, the footpaths in a particular way, then either people would, would follow that, some may not, and create their own paths, and it results in maybe some ugliness and so on, or people are forced to follow where, where the footpaths are, but you let them walk where they want to, and then you figure out what, what the pathway is. And, and I was just thinking, how do you then apply that in a city? How do you sense, right? Because basically, it's a sensing problem, sensing what people want. And how do you do that in a way that is scalable? That, that was kind of what I was thinking as, as this was going. I don't know if this story is true or not. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a really interesting case of sort of, I think they were called desire paths or something. Mm -hmm. So it was a very intentional, intentional approach. Um, I mean, it, again, it's things that, you know, we're thinking about. Um, but then there's also the question of like, what's the limit, right? So, you know, there are cases where they've done this just as a kind of interesting sort of thinking about the second order approach. There are approaches where people have done this and all the beautiful grass just turned into a massive walking mud pit, right? And so the, the solution was just 
forget it, you know, replace all the nice grass with paths. And that's not what people want, right? So I always think that there's this sort of question, someone has to lead that, right, about, you know, actually what do people want? You know, so there's this kind of basic desire of, oh, I need to get from here to here. But then if someone says, oh, well, actually, a lot of this area we could use as like picnic spaces or something, then we suddenly have to hem in the population. So I think that's, for me, that's always a question, especially as a designer, of like you're showing your client something, but you're not showing him maybe what, exactly what he wants or so on, because you're also trying to think about some other possibility. You know? um, so I find that very interesting. That case study is really you know, kind of interesting of how do you bound what's possible. You know? yeah. Absolutely. This is one of the things I love about these forums is you can actually have a real conversation about designing the types of cities that we want, where there's a real feedback between the people that are living in the cities and, and hopefully the technologists that are implementing them. So that's one of the things that excited me about this forum. Do you still have a question? It's sort of been covered the sort of okay. sort of observation now, but it just seems to me you can have a whole agglomeration of smart projects. Yeah. And that doesn't make a smart city. Yeah, which absolutely. Gets to Nick's point, which is yeah. to get a smart city, maybe you need a houseman. But if you have a houseman, then you don't have democratic input. So there is a huge tension that, and this is not a criticism, but I haven't seen any resolution. I don't see how you go from smart projects to smart city. Without someone missing out, um, and so I'm, I'm not sure how you resolve that tension. I'd be very interested in the Do you guys want to answer that? Yeah. Uh, let me Nicole? take a stab at this. I think um, somebody has to try, and some governments are more brave than others to actually try, because I think uh, you also he also mentioned you know the election cycle every four years they change. I mean, short of getting a dictatorship. You need, to, you need to have a leader who is brave enough to try it. And if it fails, it fails. But it will die a natural death, and then they'll just sort of slowly phase it out if it doesn't work. If the citizens don't like it, it, it gets phased out usually. There's a lot of programs. I think I've seen, uh, I think, for example, in Singapore, you know, the bicycle sharing program. They, they just tried it and then see what happened and see whether people like it, people use it, do people behave appropriately with the bicycles that they put them all over the place, which was the case. I think in the end we had some, like six companies in Singapore that had this bicycle sharing um, sort of companies, and I think now there's only three left, and then regulations came in after um, uh, population feedback. So, I mean, somebody has to try. And yes, there, there is, a, of course, a struggle between the people leading it and also trying something new. But uh, I mean, usually if it's something not life-threatening, it's something that uh, governments should be brave enough to try because they're the ones in the position to try it. And also, of course, make sure all the infrastructure is in place for that. Thank you, Nicole. Actually, leadership is a big component of designing any smart city or implementing any action. So I think that's an interesting topic all in itself. And David, actually, you talked a little bit about that earlier uh, with the difference between uh, leadership in different governments. And I think this could go to Kamal as well. Um, do you think that Singapore has an advantage in terms of uh, leadership in implementing smart cities over other countries? And if so, maybe why? I think one of the advantages is the size of Singapore, right? So, I mean, it is a city and, and a state in itself. So obviously, that brings benefits in terms of how quickly can you try things, and, and at the same time, you're trying it at scale. It's not, it's not suboptimal. So that's one. Um, the, the other point, kind of uh, continuing the, the previous question, when you talk about s smart nations, it's not just about government, right? It can also be how, as citizens or innovators, you build your, especially in the digital space, you build your own apps and services for others to use, right? Um, I think Singapore is, 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 is I guess, is a bit ahead in there in terms of how you let people share, how they share data with the citizens. So an example of that was, again, it's, I don't know whether you call it a, a, a smart city or not, but it was quite useful for me. So you know, three, four years back, I wanted to buy a home in Singapore, right? And being a data scientist, I wanted it to be data driven. So you know, the, the amount of data available for you to make that decision in Singapore, it's, it's all there. So I could go to URA and pull in past three, four years of transaction data in terms of every house being sold, what was, the, what was the price per square feet, what's the age of the unit, and so on. I could go in and, and pull data from 
uh, let's say, Google APIs to say, okay, for me and my wife, for every apartment that I'm looking at, how long does it take for me to travel to my workplace and her workplace, right? I could look at where are the schools located, where are the primary schools located, distance to these schools, because I mean, you have to be within one kilometer of the school to get into school and so on. So you could, you could bring all of that data in, and you could, I could build a model that said, what's for my preferences, my wife's preferences, what's the best location, which condo should I select, right? So I think that is, you know, that, that's not so much of what, what government is doing, but as citizens, as people, how do you leverage what is out there and build something that's useful for you and build something that's useful for the community? So that's another way in which I think we should think of smart nations, not just what government does, but what, what do people do at, at large? Excellent. David, did you have something to add? Yeah, just, just to add to that, I think uh, Singapore is already shown very well that they're very good at long-term planning, right? Um, it's also a, a quite large population in a very small area, and they're willing to try new things. We have both smart nations, and then you have also AI Singapore, for example. So they look into the future, they're realizing these things, and they're trying to, to do a more longer-term plan and, and understand how they can utilize these type of, of initiatives and technologies. So I think Singapore is a very good place. That's why you know, our company came here. Because we wanted to, we wanted to uh, see what we could do in this in this uh, country with a more open government in that sense. Thank you. We have a question here. You next. Hi everyone, and um, I have a question that uh, it might be simple and complex at the same time. So I will try to give a bit of um, context uh, before the question. Um, I've been a social entrepreneur for the past years, and I see that uh, most of the technologies that we are developing today, and uh, you were talking about AI, you were talking about drones, um, system to measure electricity and improve it. Most of the te these technologies are actually um, driven by profit, in a way. And um, when we plan smart cities, when we plan the future, I see also that the biggest companies investing in, um, in these technologies are companies that uh, are driven by profit. So the question is, uh, are we creating a future, are we creating smart cities that are uh, better for the economic growth, or uh, are we creating smart cities for the people? Are we measuring happiness, or are we measuring returns on uh, investment when uh, we develop it? And um, I heard that you mentioned uh, a city like Singapore, which is great. I've been living here for, uh, for many years. But there's something that is missing, which is uh, individual happiness. And uh, I noticed this in more than uh, in other countries. And Japan is another uh, uh, case where the economy is very strong. Uh, the investment in te technology is very high. But the quality of life, uh, the individual happiness is not there. So, in your industries, um, do you see happiness? Do you see uh, value on uh, people being measured, or uh, it's just returns? Maybe you can address to a specific uh, panel member. Um, well, actually, I would be curious to see if there is one uh, industry between yours which is uh, more looking into that area. So, yeah, which one is more uh, uh, looking in value? I can quickly just answer, from my point of view at least. So, I, the, the, which is kind of what we're saying is, is, is very key to what I actually, my, my uh, presentation was about, uh, which is if the government really realizes that what they're trying to do is provide a value and happiness to the citizens, then when they get pitched by profit driven corporations saying, here's some smart city solutions, if the government realizes that this is not you know, happiness driven, this is not quality of life driven, this is profit driven, they can just say no, go back and rethink. And you will have that back and forth until this profit driven corporation actually provides a solution that is, of course in the end it will be ROI driven, but it will actually provide the value, right? So the government should be playing the, the gatekeeper and pushing these profit driven corporations to actually provide solutions that are providing real value, not just revenue. To anyone else? Come yeah, on. I think just, just to add, uh, coming from a consulting industry, right, I think it's quite similar to what you're saying. A lot of our work in, in the smart city area is driven by what does the government want to do, right? Typically, there is a plan that the government has, and then we are helping them execute that. So I think it, it is not primarily driven by, um, by profit necessarily, maybe profit for us, but from a government's perspective, who is our client, it's driven by how are we making lives better for people. So that's, that's, that's obviously one. Um, 
The second, I mean, that's a simple answer. So you had a simple and complex, right? A simple answer is saying, we are, we are, we are basically solving a problem that the government identifies, which we, we think it's driven by, by the right incentive on that side, right? The, mo the more complex answer comes to when you're building solutions which are not B2 government, right? But actually B2C as citizens as a whole. So you can build a lot of these app solutions, whether it is, um, you know, uh, helping helping people solve their problems. Are they going after the right things, or is it basically monetizing um, the the value of of their data, right? So when when you use any of these solutions, it's about whether it's Facebook or the world or the other apps, right? It's about data and how do you monetize that data. So obviously, that's where I think there's more challenge in terms of is it driven by you know the the value of the data and monetizing what the individual's data value is, or is it driven by happiness? I, I don't think that anybody is looking at that angle necessarily. So that's that's a great question actually. Is that good? Or, yeah. Okay, we have a, a, another question here. So um, could the panel uh, talk a bit about what is your vision and on what is going to the a sort of first mover smart city look like in 10 years time, so say 2030, and what will be the benefits for the people living in the city, and what will be the cons for the uh, people living in the city? Yeah, well, it's to the panel. I mean, they can, I don't mind. I don't know, um, maybe I can. I, I actually think it's kind of, so you're saying the first mover, which I think is very interesting. Um, you know, um, I mean, probably one of the first movers is gonna be Sidewalk Labs over in Toronto, like they're actually sort of going for this, you know, courtesy of Google. Um, so I, I wonder, like, the first mover is probably corporate driven because, because that's where the money is to do that. Um, and also I wonder about, you know, it's kind of openness and, you know, I, I, I would wonder how private, you know, that smart city is. Um, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe doing it for the first time is, is, is a good approach because, you know, we don't know what the risks are. So it's, you know, maybe a bit like the drones. It's good to kind of test them out in some way that it's, you've got a bit of a safety cordon around it. Um, I think that that will be very interesting as a kind of a first sort of, you know, um, beachhead, if you will, of, of this technology. Um, I'm kind of more interested in what happens a little bit after. You know, like I, I kind of think maybe there's a similarity with the internet you know, the kind of internet initially was developed as a very kind of internal thing for military and for universities to sort of share information and do something really, really interesting. And actually, the, the kind of the real sort of amazing things came out of it when it began to be a lot more kind of democratic and, and open. And, you know, I think that kind of openness to data in Singapore is a great example, you know, like this kind of you know, seeing the house values. I mean, that was amazing, right? Like, and it's, you know, I think those kind of things is where it's actually gonna get exciting. Because if you have these sort of closed loop systems, I think nice things will come out of them in the same way that Google Maps and Google services work really nicely together. But if you wanna do something beyond, you know, a kind of a playpen that's kind of corporate, I think you have to kind of share the data and so on. But that might take a while before we work out what we're okay sharing or what we're not, you know, we're still not there with Facebook, for example. So um, I'm almost more interested in the kind of second move of that. So the first move, I'm going to be very interested in it, but I think it's going to be quite closed and it's going to be a bit of a sort of demo city, really. Yeah. I would say uh, in terms, well, from the more corporate uh, standpoint of uh, your, your question, uh, from Airbus point of view, for example, the drones are costing us a significant f sum of money to make. And then, um, because it's cool. I mean, drones essentially are pretty cool, and a lot of people like to see them around. But uh, they're not really, really focused, actually, that much on the ROI initially. So with all these funds that they have put in it, um, they just want to be the first mover. So the investment is being in this first mover uh, for the stickiness value. So essentially, at the end of the day, everybody wants to be the, the system, you know, the Uber of something or the Airbnb of something. The actual hardware manufacturer is just to give, give a lot of uh, us, actually, sort of credibility in that space, after which most want to move into the software uh, side of things. So you become the iOS or the Android of uh, drone mobility, which would lead into autonomous vehicles that could lead into... 
I mean, your own personal uh, mobility vehicles, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, the huge investment is made up front by a lot of corporates to be able to have that, that stickiness uh, to a certain type of technology. So that's uh, how I would also answer your question. You, you have a follow-up? Okay. My question really is more around, I mean, related to, so which is going to be the first mover city uh, and what is it going to look like in 10 years' time? So are we going to see drones in, within a city in 10 years' time? Are we going to see autonomous vehicles? Um, and what other things are we going to see in that city in 10 years' time? And what is going to be, you know, the benefits and the negatives for people living in that city? It's already here. In Singapore, uh, the drones are operating and being tested, and also autonomous vehicles are in uh, the whole One North area, uh, NTU, and there are certain gazetted areas already um, uh, within Singapore that they're going to sort of further deploy the autonomous vehicles. With regards to drones, uh, testing is already done, as I mentioned earlier on. And uh, I mean, the ship to shore one from uh, the, the shore of Singapore, two ships in the eastern seaboard have already, have already been carried out. So I mean, you only have to wait 10 years uh, within uh, maybe. It's going to increase. So obviously, depending on uh, public acceptance, you'll have more drones in the sky. You'll have more, as I said, the number of autonomous vehicles would increase in the city. And of course, depending on pushback from the population or depending on uh, certain iterations of acceptance from the general population, then you'll see a steady growth. But as uh, I think was mentioned earlier, it doesn't go backwards. It mainly just goes forward. And this goes to an earlier comment uh, where we, we, we talked about you know, what, what the cities are going to look like in the future uh, of our cities. And, and what exactly do we want? Uh, and who's driving that force? I think that's a very good uh, example of that. Um, and there's a, there's a lot that we can ask uh, you guys about what the futures will look like. And particularly, I think it was an earlier talk today, but uh, which city, which nation is leading the way? Uh, obviously, smart cities, as we've talked about, is a basket of technologies, and there are many technologies underneath there. But which, would you say that Singapore is, is leading the way in, in what you just talked about, Nicole, in terms of uh, autonomous vehicles, putting sensors and things, or is there some other... Uh, you know, countries that we should also keep our eyes on? Uh, well, there are a lot of governments in the world. I mean, you have, uh, if you have an Olympics coming, we're going to have drones to deliver everything. So Japan announced, I think, uh, a few years ago, Abe said, okay, we're going to have drones to deliver everything. In Dubai, you have the Expo coming. Drones also going to happen over there. Um, they also actually are um, uh, very invested in urban air mobility as well. So you have Dubai, you have, of course, Singapore is one of them, Dubai, uh, Japan. European countries, they're, they're trying to push, but the infrastructure is a bit more difficult. Oh, China, of course. China is a huge, there's a huge push from China. And China, the thing is, I mean, everything is, uh, especially the airspace, is all controlled by the military still. So um, they, they get, number one, they have all the land area. Number two, I mean, there's not a, they, they can do things under the radar. Um, uh, and uh, so I think uh, China, China is a big one uh, for this. I know I'm mentioning a lot of places on this side of the world is uh, where I'm a lot more familiar with. Of course, you have uh, the U.S. that's also making uh, big strides in this space. I have a comment on that as well. I think it's very interesting the, to, to the question that um, if we go... So the question you said is, is when we'll have first move on smart city, right? And depending on who you ask, we already have smart cities or we don't. And that's a perception problem, right? So if we go back 10 years ago and they would see uh, where Singapore is today, the fact that I can pick up a computer from my pocket and pay my electricity bill in the SP's app automatically, is, isn't that smart city? But for us, it's common. Like, it's what we do every day. So we don't look at it as smart city anymore. So when technology adoption passes a certain point, it becomes everyday usage. We don't see it as smart anymore. So will we in 10 years be discussing, so when is the first mover, or when are, who's going to be the first mover in smart cities, right? Uh, we might be talk, saying the exact same thing in 10 years. Yeah. 
So, so I think that we are on the right path. But yeah, what is a smart city again? It's like wearable computers. We talked about getting them in our clothes in the 90s, but they came through our phone because it was the path of least resistance. Well, in Sweden, you're already in, uh, putting in uh, what is it, chips in your skin to pay, yeah. right? Like, that's pretty smart, city. No, but it's also terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Thanks. As the question for Nicole, um, most uh, technologies have or smart technologies have iterated on existing infrastructure. So roads and parking lots have been around for a while, so it's easy to improve on them, or buildings have been around, so it's easy to think about how you iterate them smarter. But uh, for airspace, uh, not, uh, not talking about airport airspace, but for, for drones or autonomous vehicles, uh, who's going to manage that in Singapore? It can't be the air traffic controllers, so it's an entirely new space. I'm just wondering, uh, will, will uh, Airbus be advising on that? or how? Who's going to manage that in Singapore? I used to fly a small plane, and so I, I, I flew it in Singapore at the odd time. And if I just go outside of the airspace, the air traffic controllers are all over me in an instant. So I'm curious how this will play out. So currently, for drones, the Civil Aviation Authority of Singapore is the one that gives permissions, both indoors and outdoors. So for example, if we wanted to fly a drone to inspect a plane in a hangar indoors, you still need the, authority, the CAS, CAAS is uh, oh approval on that. So that's, that's the authority and, at the moment. And, so and will, will all flying objects have uh, transponders? They should. At, at this point, yes. Uh, the, Airbus, the Airbus drones have transponders. Uh, if you're talking about the recreational drones, then I, I'm, I don't think they have them at this point because it adds a lot of weight. And of course, that would greatly reduce the battery life. But the more commercial drones that we have, yes, they do have transponders. So there, there is a lot to be worked out in this space, for sure. And I think uh, that's where um, a first mover in setting up this sort of uh, system would have a huge advantage in just uh, identifying where the aircrafts are and also being able to manage the traffic autonomously. So a lot of where this is going towards for the air traffic management side of things is the autonomy. So they're going to fly it autonomously and also manage it autonomously is the plan. Yeah, one more. Uh, quick one. Uh, Neom is a planned smart city in northwestern Saudi Arabia. I'm not sure whether it's going ahead now, but do you know of any other cities in the world that are planned to be built from scratch? It's, to me, it seems like the opportunity to have a NASA or Hoover Dam type infrastructure project and have new technologies all um, addressed at, the, at one place. I think Rwanda. Rwanda is also having a big push um, in that direction in terms of uh, aerospace. But yes, there, I mean, Neom, the Saudis are basically throwing a lot of money into the, to building the city. Um, so whether there will be a seamless flow of the infrastructure, so are the consultants that are working on the air traffic management, talking to the people who are working on the drones, talking to the people who are working on the buildings, who are talking to people you know, who are working in the city with the regulators. Whether there's a connect there, I'm not sure. But there are, as you mentioned, there are cities that are um, uh, trying to do this from nothing, so just sand, to a completely um, uh, sort of a smart city, as you said. And, we always go back to that definition. What is a smart city, right? <laughs> How smart does it have to be to be a smart city? And at this point, we're talking about like flying objects and a lot of uh, IoT type technology. So, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to say this, but it's a we'll see sort of situation <laughs> with uh, Neom and Rwanda. Thank you. We have another question over here. And if you can state your name and if possible, be specific about who you want to answer. Thank you. My name is Wai Ching. I'm with Earth Heart holistic consultancy. I would like to address uh, the panel. Thank you so much for your insights and perhaps solutions and um, suggestions on this because um, I've actually been uh, gifted actually with the stewardship of two tracts of land to build as models. They're not very big, but they, they can be models and I'm very interested in integrating AI, of course, but also very concerned about how AI might concern our natural land-based connection as human beings and in terms of 
farming, agriculture, horticulture, and uh, beyond permaculture and biodynamics. And uh, how can we prevent environmental toxicity, smog, the, the uh, EMFs, from all this generation from AI? And how to keep the balance between our health with the earth and also with all this technology, which is, of course, giving rise to a lot of uh, brain tumors and cancers. Um, actually, we as a consultant, we have solutions for these, but I would like to hear how you would um, design cities to balance the two and then not have to use uh, AI technologies for these uh, human or, or um, d diseases that have been caused by exactly this kind of imbalance. David? Uh, so I, th I think, um, th thank you for a very, very interesting question. Uh, but I, th I think the more important things, uh, to, to rephrase that question a little bit is, so it's not about where can we put AI. You're trying to solve a problem, and you have a certain set of data. Uh, the tool you use should not be specified up front. Uh, a lot of companies that we talk to ha have the same thing. They say, we want to do uh, AI here. Uh, how can we do it? And we always say, well, we're not going to work with you because that's not the right approach. You need to understand what you're trying to solve, and you need to understand what the data you have, and then you can talk about what should we do. Right? So there was a lot of parts of that question. So it's, it's, it, we can, we, I would love to have a longer discussion about it. But uh, case in point, right? we're talking about smart cities. Uh, the most important aspect is quality of life the health of the citizens, what are the value that they're receiving. So when you're trying to look at these type of different solutions that you said, in the end, you know, if, if health is the most important point, then everything should be based upon you know, what, what's, the, what's the expected uh, repercussions on the health of the citizens if we do something like this. Okay. But you should never say, let's put AI on this. That's not a right approach, because there might be much, much simpler ways of doing it. I don't know if, you know, it didn't really answer the question, but I think, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's important. Does anyone else have anything else on that? I guess, I don't know, quickly, like as an architect, you know, sort of, or someone involved in that sort of stuff, we used to have a maxim, which is like, when in doubt, leave it out, right? Like, maybe, you know, I think that's the sort of, back to your sort of idea of, you know, if, if a client says, oh, we want a building and we want it to be made out of hammers or we want it to be glass or something, that's already a bit of a problem, right? We sort of, we want to focus on making a nice space for the people um, so as you say, it's this sort of strange approach to it. But um, I think what's interesting in software, for example, you know, as, as I do a lot of coding and so on, there's the sort of, if in doubt, you put it in, right? You record it, you measure it, right? Um, but coming from an architect who's kind of relatively minimalist, we were always like, well, if we don't need it, let's remove it or let's work out how to minimize it. So there's a bit of a culture clash there. Um, but I think when smart cities is kind of, arguably sort of technology encroaching on architecture and buildings, right? Um, and that's where suddenly we start introducing all these sensors and all of these things. But maybe it's actually very important to say, do we need these things, you know? And for example, you know, you could put sensors on the pavements to measure where people are walking, or we could use a system like yours and we can say, oh, we can see them, right? You know, one camera versus like a ton of technology, you know, um, I think it would be nice to sort of think about that a bit more rather than go for this very expensive, quite environmentally damaging approach of just shoving things full of little bits of silicon, you know, which maybe we don't need. You know, when in doubt, leave it out. You know. Yeah, no, no doubt. There's a lot of applications for AI, but coming back to one of the things that happened earlier today, the demystifying of AI, what it is and what it isn't and what it can actually do. And there's no doubt that it, it will play a significant role in uh, ecological damage and things like that. But, you know, it, it's very important to understand what it is today and what it is an evolution of software that can be applied, you know, mostly narrowly, but uh, also with some exciting uh, you know, future possibilities as well. You have a question? Yeah, um, Boris Petersik here from Ten Town Capital. Um, it's for the panel because I'm, I'm, it just came up the word environment, health, and and in a way, for me, a city that continues to pollute more is a dumb city. Um, so in a smart city, I, I look for solutions that actually make it a livable city. Um, you know, whether that's an OECD city or whether it's a 
Chinese, Indian, African, you know, South Asian city. Um, and, and I'm wondering whether that could be an overall driver or whether that is a big driver because it, it really hasn't come up in the first hour and a half. Um, and, and I'm just, just looking for, I guess, a, a, a bit of feedback on that. I think it's, it's quite, like, even if, if you're looking at it from a, from a capitalistic point of view, right, if you're killing your users, you're not going to make any money. So if you're trying to develop a smart city solution and it's effectively it's damaging the population and the city will shrink because of it, you know, that's not a very long-term point of view, right? Um, I, I, don't, like, I think environment is always needs to be a part of smart cities. One, part, one point of smart cities is to make quality of life higher, which we're trying to, to you know. That, to me, means like, it in, includes environment already. Right? If you're not having the environment part of that equation from day one, you're actually not doing anything that is really smart. Does anyone else have something to add? Because that's, I think, that's I think a very just important to point. Add, uh, that's a great point. I think some of the work we do from a smart city perspective is it's also smart buildings, right? So how do you basically reduce consumption of energy? I think you touched upon it a bit in terms of air conditioners and so on. If you look at malls, large office establishments, how do you have a closed loop system that looks at where are people, where are the hotspots from a temperature perspective, and therefore how do you make smarter use of your air conditioning system, and you basically reduce your carbon footprint from that perspective. So that's, that's obviously a key part of when we talk about smart cities. I think also transportation, right? I mean, if, if you go to driverless cars and, and drones and other modes, the, the hope is that you're actually reducing emissions in a way because they probably have a smarter way of delivering uh, the same services rather than a person driving and so on. Um, so I think there are those elements as well. Uh, obviously, I think when somebody asks, what does the future look like? To me, uh, 10 years from now, the future of, of what smart city should not just be you know, uh, technology and, and other aspects, but also how are we helping reduce the emissions and helping reduce global warming in a sense, right? How does, how does these technologies enable that? A simple thing that we're doing is more on smart buildings, but I'm sure there are a lot more that can be done. Smart grid as an example. So, you know, when I was in GE, six, almost 10 years back, um, we filed a patent of how do you basically re optimize at a substation perspective, looking at consumption end of line, to basically reduce your voltage down, um, and, and therefore you save energy. So there is obviously a lot more that you can do with smart meters and, and, and smarter transmission and distribution that, that's going to reduce consumption from that perspective as well. Yeah, there's clearly a lot of potential in, in AI and the implementation for the betterment of humankind, but also a lot of uh, you know, potential uh, danger as well. Thank you. Just a, a question, I guess, to David and um, Kamal. Have you managed to do any work in emerging markets? There's plenty of problems to solve, but not necessarily the, the resources. And then, uh, I mean, do you need to have, a, I guess, a certain base level of sophistication before some of your um, solutions will actually solve the, the problems that you actually see in, you know, um, emerging markets where, you know, they're still pretty basic, some places don't have garbage collection, um, no public transport. It, do they, I mean, is there an opportunity there now or do they need to sort of get to a particular level before organisations like yours can actually help? First? Yeah. Okay. So that's a really interesting question actually, simply because uh, you are very right. You know, we, we spend a lot of time educating um, the, these type of, of uh, so, so to put it in perspective, like, so when Japan is about like three years behind US when it comes to, to a understanding or application of machine learning, deep learning, and Singapore is maybe like two years behind Japan, and then you have Thailand, for example, is about five to 10 years behind Singapore, right? Um, so we, the first three years of our company, we just spent educating the market. And now we're finally in a point where Japan is able to have call us and say, we want to do this here, and it makes sense. Uh, there's a lot of education being done by, by Google and Amazon at SG Innovate on an almost weekly basis to do the same thing. We're trying to educate the market, right? Um, and actually, my entire talk was based upon a 16-month engagement in an emerging market with a company that owned an entire city. And they came to us and they said, we want you to make our city smart. And we spent a lot of time with them to just get them to a point that they understand that they're not there yet. Because the things that they asked for were basically like over here, right? We want a smart city. And we said, great, let's start here. And they said, no, 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 we want here. And we, well, you don't have the infrastructure. You don't have the sensors. You don't have the data. You have nothing. So what we can do is we can install a bunch of sensors and we can 
um, gather data on the pollution, on the, on the noise pollution, on traffic, etc., and we can make the life easier for the citizens. And they said, no, 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 but, but, but how does that make any money? Right? And I said, well, again, like it's quality of life driven, right? You're supposed to make people be happier because then the population grows and then you have more users, more taxpayers. Um, and they were like, no, no, we, we want to we wanna be smart. And then the kind of the conversation kind of just stopped, <laughs> right? So, so that entire talk I just did was based upon that experience. Uh, so yes, there's a lot of education needed. That's why we need the champion in every organization who really understands this, who can push it. Because for us trying to make emerging markets kind of grasp the concept and really understand what a smart city is, it's not shouldn't be revenue driven. It should be called it a life driven. Unless they understand that from when they start engaging with us, we're going to get nowhere. Absolutely, but, but that's also been touched on, on before, right? You, you still need, you know, the, the, the first mover typically is a capitalistic uh, mindset, right? We need to make some money because otherwise... But, but uh, in this particular case, uh, they, they owned the city. It was an industrial city. So everyone who lived in that city worked there as well. So you are already making money. So how, how about making it easier for them to live there so that they can go and shop <laughs> in better times, et cetera, et cetera, and make more money out of it, right? But that was still not enough. They wanted something smart, but they didn't know what swar smart was. They just wanted us to tell us, tell them, this is smart. So I think, I think just to add, so from an Accenture perspective, you know, if, if you look at India as an example, that's where I'd say our largest employee base is. We do a lot of work out of India. Um, but then it, when you talk about s smart nations or smart cities, the, the challenges are different. So one of the things that, I mean, there were many, many places, Accenture was one of them, uh, which helped the government of India build this whole system called Aadhaar. So I don't know how many of you know that. It's basically a unique identifier for every citizen, right? So based on biometrics, based on other sources of information. The reason why it's important uh, in, a, in a country of size of India is to make the delivery of services um, as easy as possible and also reduce corruption. So you could directly give subsidies to individuals and so on, right? So I think it's, it's, a, it's a different set of problems, right, compared to Singapore where how do I make sure that the money that I'm spending on subsidies is really going to the poor and so on. And basically, that was the attempt to basically use Aadhaar as a system to kind of make sure that there's no leakages and so on. So there are things that happen at scale, but probably they are more, it's a positive and a negative because there's, no, there's nothing now, there's no foundation. You can actually build it the way you want to, which is what was done. Uh, but there could also be more foundational capabilities and, and you basically build upon that, right? So that's kind of how I see us playing a role from an emerging markets perspective. Thank you. We have one more question here. Hi, uh, my name is Hiro Ishizaka with Mitsubishi Corporation. Uh, in Singapore, we have a, a collaboration with uh, Sirban and Jerome uh, in uh, urban development. Uh, I have a question to uh, Professor Joyce. Uh, the definition of smart has been a topic throughout this session, and uh, uh, I always also talk with my colleagues that smart doesn't equal digital. You know, so how much is it uh, initial, uh, let's say, urban planning important in terms of using technology? For example. I think currently the Singapore government is trying to reduce the uh, distance from living, commuting, shopping, and you know they're trying to revitalize the CBD by creating more homes. So, what is the right balance? You know, is it the planning that's really important to first of all reduce you know the issue in the first place, and then maybe utilizing technology afterwards? Thank you. Yeah, really interesting question. Um, I mean, I I think you know coming as I say coming from an architecture background. I'm a bit skeptical about this, like, smart cities. You know, suddenly we were sort of working on lots of cities and then a bunch of tech people turned up and went, oh, we, you don't know anything. We, we know how we're doing it. We'll show you how to design cities, right? I mean, that's also to be proven with, for example, Sidewalk Labs in Toronto, right, which I, um, you know, was nearly involved in. And it's it sort of like, well, let's see if they can design a better city. Um, you know, they've already got Heatherwick involved, so they've already started to kind of bring in architects. Um, I think there's also this sort of danger of saying, well, you know, this is a smart city, therefore the other cities are stupid or something. There's a kind of an interesting kind of wordplay there, right? I mean, ultimately, smart cities is a buzzword. 
you know, but if it gets stuff done, then that's great, you know. Um, I mean, I'm interested in, like, good cities or nice cities or, you know what I mean? Like, um, if that was a buzzword which meant we could do nicer stuff, you know, then great. Um, I guess what's interesting about smart city as a word, you know, as a, as a kind of a, a more closely identifiable thing is it's something specifically about measuring and, you know, introducing computation and so on, which I truly believe will help because there's a lot of qualitative things that have been said about cities that have no sort of scientific basis. They may be true, but they, they're not sort of rooted in a, in a kind of scientific way of measuring things. And I think, you know, as we move towards a more verifiable kind of future with this, which is possible with smart cities, then that gets very exciting because we can literally do little experiments, you know, and say, oh, what if we try this or what if we try that? Um, and will that change sort of cities? Um, so I think this sort of, this kind of introduction of sensors and so on is, is important to architecture. And, and for me, that is an integral part of, of what smart cities are. I think what's also you know, as a designer, a part of what smart cities are is suddenly being able to talk to people that do the computation and are data experts maybe from different fields and they've suddenly decided to kind of try and solve some of these things. And for me, that gets very exciting because, you know, people begin to measure things in ways that maybe are as, as kind of architectural and, and kind of civil engineering people that we haven't measured before. And, uh, you know, I think, so this for me is kind of what, sort of smart cities are. I think we need those sensors and we need those kind of algorithms to bear on, on this. Does that sort of answer the, a little bit? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's actually kind of where we began the panel, was talking about what is a smart city, you know, how do we want to define a smart city? And even earlier today, we talked about AI and, you know, what is the definition of AI? I think the first person said, is it the same as machine learning and AI? Are those equal? Well, we're still discovering the taxonomy and the nomenclature for things like smart city and artificial intelligence. And I think that these types of forums uh, are exactly the right place where we can get together and have that discussion. I hope you all appreciated the sort of back and forth and, uh, you know, the, the town hall approach to getting as much, uh, you know, input from the audience as we could. And uh, it was really, really a test to, to these fine panelists up here to be able to uh, actually participate like that. So I'd just like you all to put a huge round of applause together for our panelists. Thank, thank you very much. I told you it would be a little bit challenging and we'd try and get some uh, difficult questions. So thank you all for being great sports about that. I appreciate it very, very much. And I know I didn't get to one question, but maybe uh, you, you can ask them later if you have a specific one. Um, and also just thank you all for your participation in our smart city and mobility panel. I hope that you can all leave here you know, with at least a little bit of an idea, some questions, maybe a website to go to. Uh, you know, I, I, another, we actually have a couple websites to go to, one where you can give some feedback to the government, another one where you can play with how to design a smart city. So I hope you all left here with something to think about and also some actionable steps. So um, I'd just like to thank all of you and uh, I, we have another session here right after, so uh, you're welcome to stay. But thank you very much. <laughs>